Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's wonderful to see all of you here this evening and to see the rather extraordinary support that uh, the Alliance and that Day One continues to receive here in metropolitan Atlanta. It was a great joy during my years as the Episcopal Bishop here to have a regular and uh, ongoing association with the Alliance and with Day One. And one of the ways I did that was um, not, not just uh, as a member of the board and uh, a contributor uh, to both uh, the, the budget and to the airways, but, but also an opportunity uh, while I was here uh, to listen to almost every broadcast because as the bishop, every Sunday morning I was driving somewhere for a parish visitation and my regular rhythm was to make sure I was in the car by 7.05. Now, some Sundays I was in the car by 5.05 or 6.05, but it was a wonderful gift to be able to listen to day one on my way to preach two or three times and to figure out the sermon. <laughs> so thank you to one and all for your uh, continued uh, support of this extraordinary, life-changing ministry. It is my privilege, I want to say to Bishop Curry that you're safe, brother. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to tell any of our secrets. <laughs> uh, the only secret I'm going to tell is that uh, his, his uh, lovely wife, Sharon, uh, and I were uh, in, we grew up in the same town, we were in school together, and um, it was one of the great privileges of my life to tell her she could marry Michael. Uh, <laughs> and you can tell her I said that, by the way. <laughs> yeah, sister will love that. Now, I'm not going to go through a lot of biographical information because we all know it. He was born in Chicago, grew up in Buffalo, went to Hobart, went to Yale. He had six honorary degrees that I can count. Uh, I think there are probably a few more. He's written three books so far, and we're expecting uh, more to come. Uh, during his entire ministry, he's been an advocate of social justice but not social justice because it was au courant or it was the right thing to do necessarily or it was, a, uh, it, it, he did it out of an extraordinary commitment to the gospel of Jesus because he believes that there is no one who hasn't been died for. And so it's that commitment to the powerful life-changing love of God in Jesus Christ that drives his ministry. He's been long regarded as one of the great preachers, not only in the Episcopal Church, but in our nation. And of course, the reference have already been made to that this evening. Uh, Michael and I first met uh, some years ago, about the time he became the 11th Bishop of the uh, Diocese of North Carolina, which of course meant that he could um, move into all sorts of interesting things, like being the chairman of the Board of Episcopal Relief and Development, he could be a board member of the Alliance for Christian Media, but perhaps most importantly, as the Bishop of North Carolina, that made him an owning bishop of the University of the South. Yes. <laughs> and so it is my great honor and delight, ladies and gentlemen, to present to you the 27th presiding bishop and primate of the Episcopal Church, Michael Curry. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. I am so thankful that uh, Bishop uh, Alexander did not go off into an excursus of the many stories that he could tell. He could tell. <laughs> But there's so many other ones that I could tell, <laughs> which is why he didn't tell any of the ones he could tell. <laughs> Thank you, dear brother. It's really uh, good to be with you. And I don't know where, where Dwight Andrews is now, but Dwight, uh, who I was next door to Dwight in seminary um, in the dorm. And um, I mean, he's one of the finest musicians um, as well as pastor and theologian, but he's just an extraordinary just an extraordinary musician, and but I knew him before he was. Yeah. I heard him practice. <laughs> but to be with, with him and 
Uh, Peter, I don't know where Peter is now, but Peter Wallace and members of the board of, of Day One and, and all who are inv involved in and supportive of this work and ministry, it is, a, it is a blessing and a privilege. It really is to be able to be with you um, this day. Now, I have to admit, you really are. This is the first time I've been out after surgery and after um, being at home recuperating and watching Judge Judy with my wife and uh, <laughs> in the days of our lives and the young and the restless. Uh, you have no idea how glad I am to be with you. <laughs> it, but it really is. And I, I really do have a special, a particular reason for that. Um, I'll say just a few things um, about this, but I am, um, I am really convinced that we in the mainline traditions, uh, but certainly all Christians, but, but, but I'm part of a mainline tradition, that we in the mainline traditions really may be being called into a vocation of taking Jesus of Nazareth not only seriously, but deeply and at the very center of our lives, in the life of our church, and in the life of the world. And I think that is critical. Not only do I think it critical, it may well reflect the seeds of a new reformation. And the last time we had one of those, the world was turned upside down and changed, I think, for the good. Not perfect, but changed for the good. Every once in a while, as somebody said, every 500 years, uh, Phyllis Tickle in her great book, The Great Emergence, uh, quotes Bishop Mark Dyer saying, about every 500 years, if you look at the history of the Christian church, it seems like the church kind of goes and cleans out the attic. <laughs> like it's accumulated a whole lot of stuff over the 500 years from its living in the culture and in the world, and it kind of cleans out the attic and gets down to what really matters and what its core and essence is. And whenever the church does that, or better yet, whenever the Holy Spirit leads the church in doing that, it is a revolution and a reformation that leads us back to who Jesus of Nazareth called us to be in the first place. And that's a revolution. And so I really do pray for a Jesus revolution in the mainline tradition. Because there, I believe, we will find our soul anew. And there, I believe, we will have a witness and a message for the world in which we live. Now, before, I'm not gonna talk long, but, but of course, you know the definition of an optimist. Um, somebody who believes a preacher when he says, and in conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I'm not going to talk long. Um, but uh, the, the, the truth is that there is a sense in which um, um, this has some antecedents, to be sure, in my background and all of that. But, but I can remember one conscious awakening to this uh, back in the 1970s, this would have been late 1970s, probably 78, 79, I'm guessing, um, I was serving as a young, newly ordained young priest in, in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I was at St. Stephen's Church there. Um, I actually met my wife in Winston-Salem, which is um, um, Neil Alexander's hometown. And um, anyway, I was um, there, and I used to drive to church, you know, for the early service. And about 7.15, I think it was, on WSJS radio in Winston-Salem on Sunday morning, uh, there was what was then, I believe, the Protestant hour. And, and there were great preachers who preached. I, mean, I remember Dr. David H.C. Reed from Madison Avenue Presbyterian Church. Oh, man, what a great, great preacher. I mean, he, he had that Scottish brogue. I wanted to have a Scottish brogue so bad. <laughs> oh, how to tell you. I mean, just incredible preachers were on it, and, um, uh, and the denominations would rotate it. And I remember specifically when it came turn for the time for the Episcopalians to come on, and um, a guy named John Stone Jenkins, some of y'all may remember him. Um, I think he's retired in Mississippi now. I got a letter from him about a year ago. But he was on, and he did a series entitled, What Think Ye of Jesus? 
and it blew my mind. I used to listen to it in the car going to the church before the early service. What think ye of Jesus? And I remember him saying in one of the talks that the first followers of Jesus gathered around him. They became a community with him. And they actually listened to and learned from what he actually was teaching. And they listened to and learned from the actual example of his life that they actually saw living with him. And they listened to and learned from and imbibed his very spirit, the spirit of God that made Jesus Jesus. And they started drinking from that same spirit and listening to his teachings and daring to emulate his example. And they found themselves doing more than they ever dreamed they ever could do by doing that. And he asked, now what think ye of Jesus? I said, first of all, it's pretty awesome to have an Episcopalian preaching like this. <laughs> that, was, that caught my attention right there. But that really was kind of an awakening, kind of a clarifying that there is something about this Jesus of Nazareth. And I'm not talking about the cultural Christ now. I'm not, not, I'm not, I'm not really, <laughs> you remember the movie T Talladega Nights? <laughs> Rick, yeah, I'm not talking about the Christmas Jesus. Uh, remember? <laughs> remember he said, he just like everybody loved the Christmas Jesus. But well, somebody said, well, that baby grew up. <laughs> And that baby has something to say. <laughs> Pay attention to what he had to say. That there's something about this Jesus of Nazareth and the recovery of this Jesus of Nazareth that, that helps to lead us to the proclamation that this is the Son of God. But it's this teaching of Jesus, the example of Jesus, the spirit of Jesus, that is the, the, that therein is the actual soul of Christianity. That it was a community of people who gathered around him, who took seriously what he taught them, who dared to emulate his example, to live in his spirit, that over time they became more than they ever could have become on their own. Now the truth of the matter is, and, and I don't want to dwell too long on this, but the truth of the matter is, because this is an after dinner talk, and I don't want you to have indigestion, so I, I'm not going to talk long. But, but the the truth of the matter is, if you look at the New Testament carefully, you will soon quickly discover that this first group of disciples, the first collection of followers of Jesus, this was not um, what, this was not the A-team of apostolic discipleship that we're dealing with. <laughs> now, now, you know, I'm an Episcopalian, I honor the saints, I, I get that, I honor our apostolic ancestors, but this is not the A-team that we're really dealing with. And the New Testament actually tells the truth. It doesn't cover it up. I mean, think about um, in the New Testament, there are these wonderful stories. If you kind of read between the lines and listen to what's going on in terms of the human dynamics, you can begin to see it. For example, there's this one story where uh, James and John, uh, two of the disciples, um, in one version, um, found it, I think it's Mark's version, um, they go to Jesus when the other disciples aren't around, and they say, now, Master, we know you've been talking about this kingdom of God. So they assume that the kingdom of God means this is what happens when the Democrats take over from the Republicans. <laughs> and so they say, we know you've been talking about this kingdom of God. So when this kingdom comes into power, my brother and I really want good jobs in the new administration. <laughs> and we got a cousin who's good with numbers and we think he could be the secretary of the treasury. I mean, that's, where, that's the level on which they're really coming at Jesus. Anyway, which makes you wonder how Jesus didn't just pull his, pull, pull his hair out. But anyway, um, and you know, the other disciples hit the roof when they find out that these two guys have done this. In Matthew's version, in another version, you have parallel versions in Matthew and Mark in particular. In the other version, it's not James and John who go to Jesus to ask this political favor. They send their mother. <laughs> now that is about as low down as you can go to get your mama to do your dirty work. <laughs> this is not the A-team of apostolic discipleship that we're dealing with. Um, and if you look in the New Testament very carefully, in, in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, most of the dis original disciples, not all of them, but most of them, um, at least certainly the first four, but, but several of the others, uh, um, uh, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, the first four that he called, they were, you know what they did for a living. 
Yeah, they were fishermen. They, 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 were, they were fishermen. These guys were professional fishermen. This is what they did for a living. I define, defy you to find any example in the canonical Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. I'm not talking about the Gospel of Peter or, so, or one of the other one. In the canonical Gospels where these professional fishermen ever catch a fish on their own without Jesus telling them how to do it. I'm telling you, I think the Bible's trying to tell us this is not the A-team of apostolic discipleship. And Lord knows you get to the Last Supper and, you know, I mean, they're all confused as to what's going on and there's tension throughout the entire room and, and Jesus is like filled with anxiety and trying to figure out what should he do and, you know, what, what's the Father's will mean. And I mean, there's, there's tension in the room and, 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 and finally um, Jesus says, I'm, I'm going to be betrayed tonight. It's going we got hard times ahead, and, and Simon Peter said, Lord, don't you worry about a thing. I got your back. Let me tell you, if you know a Simon Peter who's got your back, you better walk backward. <laughs> I mean, this is not the A-team of apostolic discipleship. And the truth of the matter is, it's a good thing that, that the Lord, and they all abandoned, virtually they all abandoned him, saved the beloved at the cross, saved the one beloved disciple, one guy, and all of the other women. Uh, <coughs> the rest of them abandoned him. They ran for their lives because to be too closely identified with someone who was being executed by the power of the Roman state was to align yourself with their cause and make you potentially subject to the same punishment. So I understand why they abandoned him. But you know what? Jesus was smart. That's why he's the Lord. <laughs> they said, God is no fool. And God is no respecter of persons. And God understands that the Spirit dispenses the Spirit's gifts equally to all and does not discriminate against any. And so Jesus very wisely included in the apostolic band, not just males, but males and females. And, and the truth is, let me tell you something, it's a good thing he did because on that resurrection morning, on that Easter morning, all the brothers were still asleep. It was only the women who got up and went to the tomb. That's how we know he rose. <laughs> and yet, when you, when you look at the unfolding pattern of the rest of the New Testament and move into the Acts of the Apostles, which is kind of the story of what happened to this group after the resurrection, after the spirit of Jesus sort of was poured out and dispensed in a fullness, in a strange new way. What happened? You discovered this same group of people doing incredible things. The second chapter of the Acts of the Apostles says that they, they um, shared everything that they had in common. Um, and, and because they did that, there were no poor folk among them. They made poverty history. Yes. You want to know how they did it? They dared to follow the way of Jesus until his way became their way. You keep reading even further, and, 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 and you get to, they, they run into, they have a problem. Because all of them, the original followers, they were all Jewish. But all of a sudden, they discovered that these folk who weren't Jewish, there were some folk who weren't Jewish who were getting religion too, like my grandma would say. And, and, and they started to say, wait a minute, it looks like the Holy Spirit is falling on them the same way it has on us. You, you mean this isn't just our exclusive possession? You mean God is actually an inclusive God? Wow, what an idea. Well, they didn't come to it by an intellectual dissertation. They had to like figure out, well, how are we gonna do this? And so the Jerusalem party, um, which was sort of the institutional church. I like to say that's the early forms of the institutional church. Don't worry, I don't have anything against the institutional church. I got a pension. I'm tied into this thing. <laughs> <laughs> but the Jerusalem party, and they, they said, okay, it, it's okay for a Gentile to become a Christian, but they got to become Jewish like us. They got to observe the law. They got to do everything that we do in order to become a follower of Jesus. 
And there was this rabble rouser named Paul of Tarsus who said, nah, uh uh. All that detail is not necessary. We need to stay with the core, the essence. And if Gentiles follow the essence, then they're all right with Jesus. Jerusalem church said, no, 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 no. They got to go through all the hoops. Paul said, no, they don't. And so they organized what we were taught in seminary. And I know uh, Bishop Alexander is a professor, but I was taught in seminary what became the first ecumenical council of the church. And there were several ecumenical councils, uh, Chalcedon, Nicaea, um, I think what, Ephesus, there were several of them. Uh, I've been out of seminary too long. I don't remember what they did, but I know where they happened. Um, <laughs> but these ecumenical councils were, were the, where the great um, bishops and fathers of the church gathered and had learned discourse and, and decided a variety of things. Now, I, that's what I heard in seminary. Now that I've been ordained a good while and been a bishop a long time, and I've been in those councils, I now know you only call a church council when you're having a church fight. <laughs> you pretty it up by calling it a council, but it's really a time, how do we settle this church fight? And that's what was going on in Jerusalem. It was a down, dirty church fight. How are we gonna admit these people who are Gentiles, non-Jews, into this Christian movement? And, and so they had to organize a council, and it's recorded in the 15th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, and they had to fight it out, and they had to work it out. Because see, the problem, and, and I don't mean to disturb your meal, but the problem, <laughs> the, the problem was, it, it wasn't that hard to become Jewish if you were a Gentile woman. Are y'all with me now? <laughs> it was a little bit more complicated. Well, it wasn't complicated, just more problematic. <laughs> if you were a Gentile male. Are y'all with me? Because it required circumcision. I'll just put that out there. And, I, you know, and the truth is um, that, that it seems to me um, that was the issue. That was the dividing line. Are we going to require all these guys to get circumcised, because Gentiles wouldn't have been circumcised, to get circumcised in order to follow Jesus. Now, let me tell you something. You think we have a hard time getting men in church now? <laughs> you could just forget it. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I have these images. I remember when I was a little boy, my grandma used to always watch Billy Graham rallies, and she used to love to watch the Reverend Dr. Billy Graham on TV. Anyway, so Grandma would watch Billy Graham. They were always in Manitoba um, in Canada. And I used to say, Grandma, there's a lot of sin up there in Manitoba. Why are they always up there? But anyway, I had this image of, of the old style Billy Graham rally and uh, crusade. And you know how Billy used to invite folk down, come on down and accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Choir, I need to hear it. Just as I am without one plea. Oh, you know it. You can hear the choir singing just as I am and come down and accept Jesus. Come on, come on, hold those buses, close those doors, come down and accept Jesus as your personal Lord. And folk would come on down. It really is a marvelous thing. Imagine. <laughs> if Paul had not won the debate about how you become a Christian if you're a Gentile. Imagine Billy Graham, come on down and get circumcised. <laughs> it's a little midrash on what's actually in the Bible, but that's really what it was saying. Uh, and yet, the incredible thing is that these mortal, fallible, sinful, normal human beings figured out a way and realized that it's the core of a faith in Jesus Christ and in God. It's that core faith in God that is the circumcision of the heart, that is the key to the new person. And they realized that God was trying to tell them something new, that 
God was trying to sell him, anyone who would come to me and accept me is acceptable by me. Come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and kind, and I will show you the way to, to life. They realized this, and they discovered it, and they, they actually found themselves creating a community of Jews and Gentiles. But more than that, Paul, if you look at him in Galatians, in the third chapter, he then says, if, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And then he says, all who have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And he says, there is no more slave or free. There is no more Jew or Gentile. There is no male or female, for all are one in Christ. My brothers and sisters, because they drew close to this Jesus, and listen to his teachings, they began a revolution. They created a multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-human, whatever, before Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. They did it before the Declaration of Independence. They did it before the Declaration of Human Rights and the French Revolution. They did it before the Magna Carta. They discovered a way to human freedom, human equality, human decency, human dignity for all of God's children. They discovered it because they dared to listen to the teachings of Jesus and follow his example and live in his spirit. Oh, my brothers and sisters, I want to suggest that there's a revolution in the making, a revolution, a reformation in the mainline churches that if we take the teachings of this Jesus of Nazareth, and I'm talking about the teachings. I'm, talk, you, I'm talking about what, what the brother said in the Sermon on the Mount. Oh, we got to get close to that again. Matthew chapter 5, 6 is, blessed are the poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst that God's righteous justice might prevail in all the earth. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who despitefully use you. We need to recover that Jesus. The Jesus who met that lawyer. Any lawyers in the room today? <laughs> Jesus liked lawyers. He had a lot of conversations with lawyers. But the Jesus who, that lawyer came up to him and said, great teacher, what, what is the greatest teaching in the entire legal edifice of Moses? Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is just like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. Do you know what Jesus was saying there? All, everything the Bible is trying to say, everything the scripture is pointing to and sometimes straining to get us to see, everything that the prophets were thundering about, everything that Moses was trying to get at, everything that Jesus stood for, everything about what it means to be a Christian is summed up in these words, love the Lord your God, love your neighbor, and why you at it, love yourself. <laughs> because that is the key. Now, I want to submit, now, I'm going to stop now, <laughs> that that is the foundation of a reformation of the Christian faith and a revolution in American society and in the global community. That's what I want to submit. And that's why when I was able to say a word at the wedding of the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, as they are now. I went back to Atlanta's Martin King to a quote not often known, but a quote that says, we must discover the power of love, the very redemptive power of love. And when we discover that, 
we will make of this old world a new world because there's power in love. And Christians, but not just Christian folk, people of any religious tradition, people of goodwill and human decency, when we discover the power of love, and I'm not talking about sweet, soft, and sentimental love. I'm, I'm talking about unselfish, sacrificial, the way of love that seeks the good and the welfare and the well-being of the other before my own unenlightened self-interest. I'm talking about that kind of love. That's what Dr. King was teaching us about. That's what Jesus was getting at. He talked to that lawyer about love while Jesus was on his way to the cross. You know that was Holy Week? But Jesus was on his way. That kind of love has the power and the capacity to lift us all up, to transform, as Dr. King said, our jangling discords into a beautiful symphony of hope. The truth is, the truth is, that way of love is the heart and soul of what Jesus is teaching us. And it's the heart and soul of what it means to be his followers. And the closer you get to your real heart and soul, you'll find your life anew and again. A few years ago, and with this I will sit down, <laughs> I was making a pastoral visit to uh, one of our dioceses in the Episcopal Church, and was at their diocesan convention, um, annual council, um, and I was there and spoke, you know, during the, over the course of the days, and um, there was a banquet, and I spoke at, at the end of the banquet, and I um, was greeting people and doing selfies after the, <laughs> God bless whoever invented selfies, God bless them. <laughs> Anyway, so I was greeting people, and, and um, people were coming up, and so we were talking and taking pictures and that kind of thing. And I noticed a guy, I mean, he was sort of, a, he was really a big guy, football player kind of guy, I mean, a really big guy, uh, the kind of guy I would run behind on the football field, <laughs> hoping he would keep the other people his size away from me. But anyway, <laughs> this is a big guy. And he was, stand, he's a white guy, and, um, and he, had, he actually had overalls on, if I remember correctly. And he had a beard, and to be honest, I saw him out of the corner of my eye, and he just looked a little menacing. He wasn't smiling. Anyway, I, I could see him, and he was just waiting in line with other people, and I was just aware of him, greeting people, and finally, he came up to me, and he kind of looked, looked me dead in the eyes with beard, you know, kind of looked down. And I'm thinking, oh, Lord, have mercy. I said, I sure hope you're a nice person. <laughs> And then I could see tears welling up in his eye. I mean, you, you know, when somebody starts, you can see the tears, the water. And he said, I want to thank you for being here. I said, oh, I want to thank you for saying that. You have no idea. You, <laughs> you have no idea. He said, I want to thank you for being here. And I want to thank you for this church. And he was referring to the Episcopal Church, but... I want you to hear this as a message to the main line. He said, I want to thank you for this church. He said, see, I was, I was born and I was raised um, in a family who were active in and high up in the Ku Klux Klan. And I was born and I was raised in hatred and bigotry toward black people, Jews, Catholics. He says, that's how I was raised. And I went off to school and I allied myself with, you know, people who agreed with me and shared my views. He said, when I left school, I moved to a small community and I believe it was in Arkansas, but I'm not, I think it was somewhere in Arkansas. I moved to a small community and he said, I on one Sunday morning, I went in a little bitty church, had about 10 people in it, this little Episcopal church, and he said, those folk just took me in. 
And he said, they actually loved me even when I told them who I was. They took me and loved me. And they helped me understand who Jesus is. And they gave me my life again. And I just want to thank you for being my bishop. And thank you for this church. My brothers and sisters, do not underestimate the power of redemptive, unselfish, sacrificial love. It has changed the world before, and it can change the world again. Maybe even for the day when elephants and donkeys Help me, Jesus. <laughs> Maybe for the day when we in America will overcome our divisions and join hands together as brothers and sisters, children of God, and find a better way. God bless you. God keep you. And day one, Keep on preaching the love of God. Yeah. God bless you. <laughs> Thank you.